Well, welcome to you. It's great to have you join our service. My name is Greg Cushing. I'm the vicar of Allfold and Loxford Parish in the Church of England. And um, today is Sunday the 10th of May. Hope you're having a good bank holiday. Uh, two days ago, Friday the 8th of May, it was the 75th anniversary, the e day where we paid tribute to the sacrifice and service of the whole of the World War II uh, generation and um, for many, many lives who've been lost in all the conflicts since then as well. I'm going to begin with a prayer and our prayer is not just for our time now. We'll also be thinking back to the two minute silence maybe and to those who gave their freedom up for the sake of others. Let's pray. Lord God, our Father, we pledge ourselves to serve you and all humankind in the cause of peace, for the relief of want and suffering, and for the praise of your name. Guide us by your Spirit. Give us wisdom. Give us courage. Give us hope. And keep us faithful now, in and during this service, and always. Amen. Well, before we launch into our service, just one quick notice for our regulars. An email has gone out. Please do sign up for prayer slots for our week of 24-7 prayer in the run-up to Pentecost. And please do uh, join us for our Sunday evening uh, times of prayer on Zoom at 8 o'clock. be great to see you there. And I should say too that um, we have set up a hardship fund. If you're in our local area and are in need of support, be it food or, or financial support, then do get in touch. We'd love to see how we can help you out. For now, I'm going to play a, a video that was created by churches up and down the country, over 65 different churches, um, praying a prayer of blessing in song. It's a, it's a video that moved me. It went viral this last week. Words taken straight out from scripture, the ironic blessing. I hope that it blesses you too for the blessing.
pray a blessing. Mana rain down from heaven. This isn't second guessing. We know that we are protected. May the peace that surpasses all understanding be our message. Grace and favors in your nature, in your essence. May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations. And your family and your children and the children and the children. May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations. And your family and your children and the children and the children. Be a party and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may you stay I don't know how you feel after hearing those words sung. Uh, I feel incredibly uplifted. Uh, just so many churches coming together to, to, to lift their voices, to praise God, to, to think of this nation, to think of the world and pray blessing over it fills my heart with hope. Yes, our church buildings are closed, but the church is not shut by God's grace, by his spirit of power. We are still serving him in serving this broken world. I don't know about you, but after listening to that, I just wanted to pray. And so I'm going to pray the Lord's Prayer now. We very often just tag on the Lord's Prayer at the end of a time of uh, intercession. But actually, this is how Jesus taught us to pray. And, and there's times when you just want to pray and you don't know what you want to pray. The Lord's Prayer is a great thing to do. And that's how I'm feeling right now. I just want to say something to God. So if that's you, then please do join me with the words of the Lord's Prayer. They'll be up on the screen. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, 
the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Well, now before uh, the Lionheart's activity, and you will have some arts and crafts parents that you can do with your children. Before then, Kim and her son Jordan are going to lead us in a action song that applies to the adults too. Get up on your feet, you can dance, you can sing. And then after that, Ian Taylor will bring us our reading before I preach on another passage in 1 Peter. Hi everyone. We are going to be doing a song called Every Move I Make or Waves of Mercy. And we know that most of you children know the moves to the song. So follow along if you know the moves and you can teach your parents as well. Here we go. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every authority instituted among men, whether to the king as the supreme authority, or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to command those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish men. Live as free men, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as servants of God. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the brotherhood of believers. Fear God honor the king. Slaves, submit yourselves to your masters with all respect, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. For it is commendable if a man bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because he is conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Wives, in the same way be submissive to your husbands, so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behaviour of their wives. When they see the purity and reverence of your lives, your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as braided hair and the wearing of gold jewellery and fine clothes. Instead, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. 
for this is the way the holy women of the past who put their hope in God used to make themselves beautiful. They were submissive to their own husbands, like Sarah, who obeyed Abraham and called him her master. You are her daughters if you do what is right and do not give way to fear. Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for those words from 1 Peter. Ian just read for us. Pray that by your spirit, you would be moulding and shaping us through those words. Help us to heed the challenge with grace for your glory's sake. Amen. Well, there is no doubt that today's passage is a challenging one. And can I just say for a second, uh, that's why I love working our way through the Bible, kind of book by book each week, rather than just uh, one-off uh, topical series, although from time to time we do that as well. Uh, the, the joy of working our way book by book and the challenge is that we're confronted with all of Scripture, not just the bits we like reading, but the, the uncomfortable bits as well. And I think that's important. You see, these words in this book, which are revered by millions and millions of people all over the world, remind us that our God is so different from what we tend to think up here when we think of what we'd like God to be like. You see, God reveals himself in his words, and we see that in Jesus. God reveals himself fully in Jesus, and Jesus completely and wholeheartedly honours the Bible. And therefore, if we start to think simply with our own rationale outside of Scripture, then nine times out of ten, our thoughts are probably going to stray from who God really is and how he reveals himself in the Bible. You get what I'm saying? Let's just take this, this lump of Play-Doh. Um, this is Josh's Play-Doh. Let's just take this lump of Play-Doh for a second. Very often, we can treat God like a lump of Play-Doh. And so, you know, in my mind, I think that God should be kind to everybody. So I sculpt him in that way. But actually, no. I don't think that he should be kind to that person who stole millions through, through tax evasion, so I'm going to reshape my God that way. Um, and he should actually be forgiving. I think we'd all agree God should be forgiving to, to certain people, um, but not the, the tax people. And so I keep on shaping um, God like that. Um, and we know that we're to love others, but uh, you know, my God says, no, it's okay to sort yourself out first. And it's not necessarily a bad thing if I'm the only person with a convertible on my street. And so I keep on, I keep on shaping God and, and, and that's what he looks like. And do you see where we end up by allowing our thoughts to shape our impression of God? He becomes impotent. He's certainly not the all-knowing, all-powerful, majestic God. Instead, he, he becomes just a little reflection of, of my values, what I want, how I'd uh, like to be seen. And we therefore find millions and millions of, of little gods all over the world. Everyone is doing it. Friends, the truth is, if God is God, then we come to him on his terms, not on our own. The irony is that God himself is the great potter, not us. I was seriously struck by a, a YouTube video. I was watching the other day. It featured Francis Chan and many of the regulars will know he's an American pastor that I greatly admire. And he was being asked a tough question on sexuality, which we won't go into now. But his answer kind of just stopped me in my tracks. And it made me confess there and then that I don't always treat this book as I should. He, he basically said, look, before answering your question, the issue here and the issue for every question, every question on ethics is surrender. Before I even look at God's word, before I get there, am I going to surrender to God? That's the question. If there is a God and he is infinitely bigger than me, then first and foremost, 
Am I going to surrender to him? Regardless of what he says. Big question. Chan goes on to say, for me, yeah, I am because he's God. You know, who am I? He's God, he's huge. And then he goes on to say this, you know, I'm Chinese origin. So here's the thing. If I read in the Bible that God told all Chinese people to walk on their heads, what would I do? Well, I'd, I'd do that. You know, I might not like it, but I'd do it because he's God. Now, okay, he's uh, making a joke there at the end, isn't he? But it pushes the point all the more, doesn't it? Before I come to God's word, have I determined in my heart of hearts that God's infinitely bigger than I am, that he therefore knows better, and therefore whatever he says, whatever, I'm going to surrender. Well, friends, that is the real challenge today. It's not just uh, the words in here it's whether or not we've decided to surrender to an almighty who we believe knows better than we do well that's a start to a sermon just there uh, I, I guess i could just stop couldn't i we'd certainly have um, a, a big thought to keep on mulling over but anyway we are going to have a look at our verses in one peter we started a series in one peter and in this letter we hear that call of god's be holy because I am holy. It's a call for all Christians around the world. And we've already seen how Peter has reminded us that as Christians in this world, we are exiles or foreigners, as some translations put it. This is not our home down here on earth. The customs around us, not our customs. And sometimes our belief in God seems to be in conflict with the world around us. Our home, our citizenship is with God in heaven. And with that in mind, in our passage today, in the call to be holy, Peter focuses in on three areas of life. Firstly, as citizens in general, chapter 2, verses 13 to 17. Then secondly, in our work lives, I think he's getting at, verses 18 to 25. And then thirdly, within Christian marriages, chapter 3, verses 1 to 7. We're going to dive in and see what God says in those three areas. Firstly, then, how to be a God-fearing citizen. Chapter 2, verses 13 to 17. How to be a God-fearing citizen. Have a look at verses uh, 13 to 14. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. Now perhaps these verses on first reading, they just kind of float past us. We don't really take them in. But then on a, on a second or a third reading, we remember when Peter was writing and the challenge of them, it kind of just stops us in our tracks, it slaps us in the face. For God's sake, says Peter, submit to the emperor. Who's the emperor in Peter's day? It's the Roman emperor Nero. He hated Christians. In the aftermath of the great fire of Roman in 64 AD, which burned two thirds of Rome, by the way, when rumours started spreading that it may have been Nero himself who had caused the fire, maybe to make space for his new palace or something like that. What did he do? Well, he put the blame on the Christians and it led to the first huge persecution of Christians in the empire. Christians living in Rome during the days of Peter lived in distressing times. Peter himself would be put to death at the hands of the emperor Nero. And yet, what does he say? Submit to the emperor and it may well be you're, you're sitting listening with a, a political rumbling deep down in your belly maybe you know your family have always voted one way and now it's the other party who are governing the land or, or maybe it's presently you know it's, it's a policy of some sorts regarding finance finances it's a certain tax which they're 
and pushing out, which you feel is just so unjust. I'm sure all of us, we've got those kind of frustrations. And Peter here says, submit not just to kings, not just to queens or emperors, but to governments too. Why? God has put them in place. Sometimes we might wonder why on earth God has placed him or her or that party in place. And yet, that question of chance surfaces once again, doesn't it? Am I willing to simply surrender that God knows best? That he is in control? I think in these verses, I find verse 16 most challenging. It says, live as free people. Bo but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves or servants. And again, I, I don't know about you, but sometimes the thought crosses my mind that because as a Christian I'm in exile, you know, because my home's up there in heaven, that the rules down here, the customs, they don't really apply to me. Jesus has freed me. I can do as I wish. And yet freedom in God's kingdom is redefined. You know, my understanding of freedom, your understanding, it's probably always going to be tainted by selfishness. And I think, therefore, that freedom means doing what I want. Yet, freedom, according to Jesus, means doing what God wants. And that means trying as hard as I possibly can to be an honourable, respectful citizen. You know, when the government says today, stay home, uh, exercise, only for one hour outside of your homes each day. Yeah, I find that hard. We've probably all broken that plea, myself included. But, you know, I jolly well try my hardest to submit to that because first and foremost, I know it's, it's not just what the government wants, it's what God wants. My life is about serving God. Well, before we move on, can I very quickly mention the hierarchy Peter highlights in verse 17. Just in case we're confused as to who's ultimately in charge. So verse 17 reads, I'll read in the ESV here, Honour everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honour the emperor. Now the hierarchy of respect and reverence is made all the more obvious here by the verbs which are used, and I'm going to be showing you uh, on the screen. So firstly, fear God. That's the most important thing. Fear God. He is the most mighty. He is the only one who can truly invoke fear. He's at the top. Secondly, love the brotherhood. You know, love does crazy things, doesn't it? In other words, go out of your way to serve the church. Fear, love. And then thirdly and finally, the word honour is used twice. Honour the emperor like you honour everyone else. So, you know, he, the emperor and others, they don't have to have chief place or a soft spot in your heart, but you just need to, to honour them. And that's the hierarchy, friends. Why do we respect the government's wishes? Not because we're afraid of what the government might do and fear them but ultimately because we are God-fearers. We respect him, we love him above all. Now, I guess this is why some over the years as Christians, you know, they've wrestled and prayed with verses like these, and then they've decided that it's right to confront dictators. You might be thinking of Bonhoeffer and the assassination attempt on Hitler. Anyway, that's how we're to be good, honourable citizens. Secondly, verses 18 to 25, how are we to be good employees? How can we be great employees? And when I read these verses, I honestly feel like crying because I don't know about you, but they're what I long for as a Christian. You know, I long to be gracious like Jesus, you know, but so often I rail against being disrespected. So we might expect Peter to write the obvious, hey? How to be a great employee? Well, be prompt, be on time always, be respectful of your boss, be hardworking, and then he'll treat you well, etc., etc. And yet, what does he say? 
Verse 20, have a look down. How is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. Now, yes, I realise that the context is different talking about slaves and masters. And I know we still have, sadly, so many different forms of slavery in the world today, which we've decided with the last point in mind that fearing God might mean fighting against that. I hope it does, rightly so. We stand up against those who are imprisoning little children in horrific forms of slavery. However, with our current context in mind, I've, I've jumped from slavery, which, believe it or not, was considered slightly different from the slavery these days, um, considered an acceptable form of employment back then to the employee-boss relationship today. That's why we're talking about employees, not slaves right now. And although we might not have bosses who would physically beat us today, I hope we don't, even so, Peter is saying that even if we do have the meanest, nastiest, most lazy boss, what? Honour them. Keep seeking to be the hardest working employee you can be. Now, I've got to say, we find that hard, friends, that is so kind of cultural. I know I found work at times in the past frustrating because I feel like my boss has had unfair expectations. I've had lots of friends in much worse situations. And the world's advice, you know, in those kind of situations has been, just stuff them. You go into work tomorrow and you tell them to their face, stuff you. Now, that's just me being real. It's how we feel. Grace. Grace. You know, it isn't just a prayer at meal times. To receive grace is to receive something we do not deserve. And God calls us into the realm to be gracious like Jesus has been towards us. Let me just read those beautiful words from verses 21 to 25. And friends, as I read these words, can I remind you that this is the Christian hope. It's because of the truths in these verses that anyone, you, me, anyone, can know the forgiveness of God. It may well be as I've been preaching, you've been thinking, Greg, this, this call is it, unrealistic. I cannot do what you're asking. I know I've messed up so many times before. And, you know, if I'm honest, I can only see that happening again with my current boss. Well, friends, I've been there too. These verses are for people like you and for me, conscious that we've fallen below God's perfect call. So verse 21 then. Have a listen to these verses. They're wonderful. To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the overseer and shepherd of your souls. In our time of prayer and reflection after this, Maybe you just need to take some time out and meditate on those words. Jesus himself bore our sins. Now these verses, this is, this is bigger than just life at work. This is talking about you as a person, you as a very being. You know, if you trust in Jesus, then, then everything, you know, all your sin, all your sin has been dealt with 2,000 years ago at Calvary. Now this is the assurance Paul in the Gambia last week was, was talking about. Nothing can hold you down. Jesus has freed you. And so not only is he our example, 
Here in these verses, he is also the shepherd, the overseer of your very soul, the deepest possible part of you. You know, when you, when you rip away all of the masks, all of the fronts, you get to the very core of you, that's where you find Jesus ministering. Wow. So how to be a good citizen, how to be a great employee. Thirdly and finally, how to have great lifelong marriage. Chapter 3, verses 1 to 7. How to have a great lifelong marriage. And there is no doubt that these tricky verses, I'll be honest with you, I'm not too sure how to go about addressing this live on YouTube for all the world to see when some of you tuning in, you don't know me, you can't um, sit down with me and, and have a chat about this in more detail. And I, I know too that some of you listening will be husbands and you're going to kind of be rubbing your hands right now thinking to yourself, preach it Peter, preach it. <sighs> well, I was asked this last week, what proportion of those getting married today use the traditional Church of England marriage vows. You know the one I mean, the, the traditional one where the woman, that the bride, includes the word obey in her vows. So she doesn't just say to love and to cherish till death is to part. She says to love, cherish and obey till death is to part. Whereas the groom simply says to love and to cherish. Well, I'll be honest, I don't know what the stats are today, but I can't imagine it's very high in people opting for that in, in a world of, you know, me too hashtags. Well, words like obey, they conjure up feelings of, of, of male dominance. And so, if I'm honest, it really doesn't bother me whether the traditional vows or the more modern vows which omit the word obey are used. However, the reason I say that is because I think that Cranmer and co missed the trick when defining the vows we have in our prayer book by only including an extra for the bride with the word obey and not the, the husband. So if you just think back to our passage, chapter 3 verses 1 to 7, back in Peter, there's loads of stuff about the wives being quiet, I'm PC, but there there's, there's also a call to the husband, verse 7, to be considerate of their wives, to treat them with respect. And similarly, Paul, in his letters, exhorts husbands to be sacrificial towards their wives. You see, I would wholeheartedly endorse the use of traditional marriage vows if it included something, not just for the bride, but also for the, the groom, something along the lines of to love, cherish, and be sacrificial towards your wife. I'd wholeheartedly endorse that then. Do you get what I'm saying? If you know the person you're to love in submission or obedience, whatever word you want to use, if you know that they are going to lay their life down for you, sacrificially, whenever you're in danger, then you know, all of a sudden that moves you. And who cares about being PC? It's not a chore anymore. It, 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 it's a joy. You love doing whatever you've got to do for that person, knowing that they'd lay their life down for you. And guess what I'm saying is to, to sit with these words in this book when they're tough, when they feel un-PC. Sit with them. And ask yourself that question, you know, am I going to surrender to God whatever he says? And I'll let you decide for yourself on these verses. But at the very least, I hope you can see that if more couples, married couples, put these words into practice in today's Western society, then so many marriages would be saved. There's so many lessons in these seven verses. If you just you know, lay the, the un-PC aspect to the side for a second, not let that colour your impression. You, just think about it, you know, in the verses. Today we make so much of image and body image and, 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 and it's dangerous. It can cause various illnesses, it can cause bullying, it can cause self-harm. And yet here we're reminded, God cares more about our heart, our true self, than the mask of body image we put on. Well, that is to be the case in marriage too. In marriage, are we working on our character? 
Husbands, do you compliment your wife's character more than you do her body? Wives, likewise. I think if we read these verses truly and honestly, we recognise that both husband and wife thrive, they truly thrive when such love, respect and patience is shown. It's sad, isn't it? that um, during this lockdown you might have heard domestic violence has risen. Let's not beat around the bush. Many of those instances have been in marriages. We've forgotten the art of communication, of patience, of respect. And God in this letter and, and other letters in the Bible has so much to teach us. Can I encourage you, if your marriage is struggling, why not read these verses? prayerfully, honestly. Ask yourself, what part are you playing in the struggle? But more than that, you know, why not sign up for a marriage course? Recommit that you're going to do whatever it takes because you respect your partner too much to just become another statistic. And finally, on these verses, can I end with just one quick word to any of you who are married to, to non-Christians? And I know... There'll be many of you tuning in. This applies to you. Your daily prayer, your hourly prayer is that the Lord might just soften the heart of your husband or your wife. It's the hardest thing for you that your spouse isn't supportive of what's most important to you. And worse than that, they often ridicule you for it. And it often leaves you with tears. And I can't imagine how you must feel. I know it's hard. And if that's you, Keep going. Keep doing what you're doing. Do not think for one second that your spouse has not recognised the beauty of your character when you're trying to live more like Jesus. Do not lose hope. And know that God bottles those tears up of yours. They're precious to him. And he smiles over your efforts. My well, friends, that's the challenge of our passage today. It's a call to be holy in those three areas of life. As good citizens, as good employees, and to have great marriages. And the question behind it all, as we've been thinking about, is uh, where we started. Do I believe that God is God, he's bigger than me, and, and therefore I'm going to surrender to whatever he says? Can I do that? Now I'm going to hand over to John Bundock, who's going to lead us in a time of prayer and reflection. It will be slightly different from our usual intercessions, because today and uh, over the next two preceding uh, Sundays, uh, John will be taking us on a journey of the 15 stations of the cross. So today we'll do the first five stations, but it does allow us a, a time of journeying in prayer as we think of Jesus' journey to uh, the cross. Please do use this time both to intercede uh, for the world and I'm sure much of uh, the journey John speaks of, the prayers that he offers will allow you to do that, but also use this as a time of confession, thinking of that call to be holy, those times where we haven't lived up to God's call. Over to John. Jesus before Pilate. A poor, itinerant rabbi faces judgment. He stands before Pilate, representing the vast pagan empire. Jesus proclaimed and displayed a kingdom of justice and mercy, but those on the edge are brought to the centre. The poor, the sick, the weak are affirmed and treated with dignity and respect. And those with wealth, authority or power are challenged. The previous evening, he had stooped in humility to wash the feet of his friends. This was to remind them that self-giving love expressed through service is the path to greatness in his kingdom. We are now being judged. 
As we reflect on life before COVID-19, we could ask ourselves whether our values, attitudes and lifestyles have been those of the Kingdom. Have the sick and the elderly received the support and care they needed? Have our nurses and care workers been valued and adequately remunerated? Have we made a creed of greed, placing multimillionaires on pedestals and ignoring the silent voices of the homeless, the hungry and the poor, left like Lazarus, helpless at the gate? Recalling the origin of the pandemic in a meat market, we are guilty of being irresponsible stewards of your creation. Lord, have mercy on us and help us to recognise our failure to live the life of your kingdom. Jesus has a cross placed on his shoulders. Jesus feels the weight of rough wood bearing down on his body. He now faces a journey through the narrow streets of Jerusalem, packed with Passover pilgrims. The citizens of this country and every country in the world have now received a cross. They feel it bearing down on them in different ways, in varying intensity, mentally, socially, emotionally, physically, spiritually. We don't know how long this Via Dolorosa will be or what course it will take. Lord, may we be conscious of the crosses that others are carrying and be given the strength to carry our own cross. Jesus falls for the first time. Jesus was arrested, taken prisoner, and interrogated by the Jewish leaders, denied sleep, and the next day publicly humiliated, scourged, crowned with thorns, and condemned to death. His body is weak, and he falls to the ground. David Knott, a surgeon used to working in war zones and now working on an intensive care unit, says, Never in a million years did I think I would experience something like this in London. All of us feel anxious about going to work. The longer you're here, the more chance of getting it. Rosina Allen Khan formerly a trauma doctor and now an MP, is now working at St George's Hospital Tooting. She says, a disproportionate amount of medical staff die. I don't worry about myself. I worry that by going to work, I'm putting my family at risk. That's what all healthcare professionals are feeling. It takes an element of courage to go to work. I went into the profession to save lives. It's who I am and what I do best, even more than being a politician. Father, protect our doctors, nurses, hospital chaplains, and others who put their health at risk. May they have the appropriate protective clothing. Jesus meets his mother. How can this be? asked Mary when she felt the mysterious call to be the mother of Jesus. How can this be? asked Mary. Now she sees her son on the way to Golgotha. She steps forward to embrace him. No words are necessary. Her tearful embrace expresses what's in her heart, a heart of love, pierced by the sword the Simeon had referred to when her baby son was presented in the temple. Every
Every time we hear the news bulletins, we are told how many people have died. For each person who has died, many are experiencing the grief of parting. Mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, work colleagues, friends and others. They will be asking, how can this be? Lord Jesus, we bring to you all who have been bereaved, asking that they may come to know you as the resurrection and the life. Simon of Cyrene helps Jesus carry his cross. Jesus receives the help of Simon, a stranger, a man from North Africa. Jesus who exercised the ministry of the Good Samaritan, is now the wounded Jew lying by the roadside. He is ministered to by a stranger and grateful for his help at this time of need. People are suddenly finding themselves in hospital. Their well-being, their healing, perhaps their life, depends upon the willing care provided by strangers nurses and doctors, some of whom are retired. This was so of Boris Johnson, when two nurses, one from Portugal and the other from New Zealand, attended him for long hours. Many elderly people, poor families, or those who are regarded as being vulnerable, are now discovering strangers offering their help in practical ways especially the provision of food parcels. Father, we thank you for people who are like Simon, helping those they don't know carry their cross. Well, thank you very much, John, for those words of reflection and prayer. As our service uh, draws to a close before our final hymn, which I'll be uh, singing with you in just a few moments' time, uh, might I say that now might be a good time if you'd like, as we have done in previous weeks, to, to press pause and to share the bread and the wine with loved ones in your home or even on your own. We've called this an informal breaking of the bread. It's, it's nice to take part in um, that meal which the Lord commanded us to do. And, and in so doing, obviously, it's different from how we'd appreciate Holy Communion in church when we gather together. But you might just remember as you do that, that Christ died for you. He shed his blood for you. He broke his body for you, that he will come again. Our hope is not in vain. Do feel free to do that. But for now, for our service online, we're going to turn in our Mission Praise hymn books and sing 549, if you've got a book at home, Our Eyes Have Seen the Glory. I'll sing a cappella. Words will be on screen. Please do join with me. Our eyes have seen the glory of our Saviour Christ the Lord. He is seated at his Father's hand in love and full accord. From there upon the sons of men his Spirit is outpoured. All hail ascended King. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. All hail ascended King. He came to earth at Christmas and was made a man like us. He taught, he healed, he suffered, and they nailed him to the cross. He rose again on Easter day, our Lord victorious, all hail ascended King. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah, all hail ascended King. 
The good news of his kingdom must be preached to every shore. The news of peace and pardon and the end of strife and war. The secret of his kingdom is to serve him evermore. All hail ascended King. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. All hail ascended King. His kingdom is a family of men of every race. They live their lives in harmony, enabled by his grace. They follow his example till they see him face to face. All hail ascended King. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah, all hail ascended King. Glory, hallelujah. God, you are awesome. We love you. We've given you this time and we give you our week. At uh, church, when we gather together, we'd usually have a, a collection plate at the back. We don't pass it around. It's just at the back of church. And I remember somebody telling me that a vicar used to say, look, if you can put any change in it, please feel free. But it might be a week where you really want to stick your hand in and grab a load of change. And I want to say online that if you are in need financially in our community, then please do get in touch. We've set up a hardship fund. We'd love to help you out. Please do uh, let me know. If you are in our community, in our parish, then we can offer help in sorts. Final blessing. May God give you his comfort and his peace, his light and his joy in this world and the next. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Have a great week. God bless.